You're listening to Got Tech, the podcast with your hosts, Eric Geis and Nick Johnson. Welcome back to Got Teched, the podcast. This is episode 128 called Four Lesson Activities for Teachers to Try in 2023. And this episode will play a lesson design game using our brand new wheel of EdTech and share some of our New Year's resolutions. This is another episode you don't want to miss. Check it out. So back with 128, this will be our last episode for 2022. I'm not really sure how I feel about this. I feel like 2022 went by in a hurry, uh, but yet I do remember some long weeks in there. So I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm very confused. How are you feeling? I also feel confused. I got a cold. I don't know if it's coming through in the, uh, the recording of my voice. So my head's a little bit uh, in the clouds here. I'm kind of just flying by the seat of my pants with this episode, which which could be good, could also be really bad. Uh, so I'm a little nervous, especially for uh, a new game we're going to try playing later on. I don't want to give uh, too much away about that just yet, but um, yeah, we'll we'll see how it goes, man. I'm, I, in any case, I'm excited for the, you know, this is pretty much our, our New Year's episode where we always get into some some of our resolutions uh which we're gonna sort of start off the episode with and then hopefully share some uh very creative on the fly lessons with everybody uh later on so if you're just checking this out depending if you're doing it on the release date which is going to be during that last week of december and you you celebrated some holidays happy holidays happy new year as we approach 2023 and uh, that's really just our big update. I mean, getting into that new year, some of us have been off for a week or two already. Uh, some teachers are probably just now starting to think about school again. Maybe, maybe not. But hopefully today is refreshing and it gives you a little bit more of a chance to maybe spark an idea that you can implement into your classroom teaching after the break and and that's really what we're trying to do and uh so that that is our big update is just that new year's we will remind you that march 7th uh the njecc conference is taking place we will be there we will be doing two sessions the first session is our edtech throwdown which is you know our fan favorite this is one that uh We typically, you know, pack a room and we have a lot of fun with. It's very engaging. And the second one is very exciting as well. We are teaming up with Chris Nessie of the House of Ed Tech. And we are going to do a panel on student content creation. So whether that's podcasting, blogging, artwork, whatever it may be, how do we make student content? content creators and that's what that panel is all about we'll answer any questions that you may have about that we'll share some resources it should be a good time this podcast is a proud member of the teach better podcast network better today better tomorrow and the podcast to get you there you can find out more at teachbettercom slash podcast now let's get back to the episode so let's get into segment two here Are the, the to kick off uh, the New Year's episode. Of course, what you're going to want to hear first is sort of what we're thinking for our, our upcoming new year. And this we try to keep this, you know, half related to education and half not. Um, I'll kick it off maybe if you don't mind uh, just with something I've been thinking about. And, you know, what obviously what you want to try to avoid with your New Year's resolutions and is that thing where you... You say, like, I'm going to finally start working out in 2023 on a regular basis. And then you do it for like a couple weeks and life gets busy and you and you fall off the wagon. So I always try to pick things that like I know that I can do or that I know I was probably going to do anyway, just so you don't get into that habit. And one of mine is, um, you know, this is more on the professional scale, but I really want to start doing more gamification and game element stuff. Uh, in my classes, it's it, I've always been attracted to the idea of like a classroom, like an ongoing classroom points system. And I think I'm going to start it up with um, little 
tokens that I actually print that have my class logo. And this came about because my students this year, there's a group of, group of them that are particularly uh, obsessed is not the word, but interested in the stickers that have my class logo on it. They all want them for some reason. So I was hoping to capitalize on that and make these stickers like available for them to earn basically for doing things in class. The other piece to this too, this is for the tech coaches out there, or even if you're just a, you know, a leader in your department, someone that people go to for help with lessons or technology or any of it, um, using some type of a game element or point system to help pe- to help teachers learn about ed tech too. We were at a, a conference of tech coaches, just a local thing uh, within the past few weeks. And a lot of the other tech coaches said that they do this type of thing. Their staff members can earn points or gift cards or, you know, different bonuses for showing that they learned how to use, I don't know, let's say a gimp kit and they tried it out. They can actually get stuff for doing that. Yeah, I was hesitant about it because I'm not sure how that would, would go. But all that stuff, it's it's always worth trying, even if it doesn't work out in the end. So that's just something I've been mulling around a lot. And I think I'm going to use New Year's to, to hop on the gamification train. Yeah, I think uh, the gamification one is awesome. Uh, I wish I had a, a class that I could get into Survivor because I once played Survivor with my whole class for a whole year. It was a lot of fun. I had to get very creative because after the first semester, I was handing out flint like it was no one's <laughs> business. Paper flint, that is. Uh, but, yeah, there's awesome ways that you can get, you know, these types of games set up in your classroom just to increase student buy-in. So I'm, I'm all for the game elements. Uh, just like you, uh, I have a professional goal as well. And, and for me, I just want to add more creativity into my lessons. and And that's... That's what it's about. I want them to utilize Canva or free uh, Canva subscription. And I want more improv learning. So I think at the beginning of class, there are ways that you can just do improv learning. And that's just give them a topic within your content and tell them to get creative with it. Tell them to tell a story one day, make a comic one day, you know, do a diagram or give them a graph and tell them this them to make the story of the graph or tell them to come up with a scenario that fits the results of that graph. So if you have no labels on that graph and you just strictly give them, you know, a couple lines on the graph, tell them to tell the story of that graph when they have nothing there except for two data points or two lines or two bar graphs or something like that. I want, I want more of that stuff because A lot of the times, it's not so much the content that's important. It's knowing the process to get the answer. And if we are able to give them an improv learning situation, then they are working with the process and they are not working solely with the content. And I know that the content is important for them there and thou, but the process is what's really important as they go away from your class. But if you get them good at the process then I think the content will fall in more naturally. Yep, I agree. And there's nothing more nothing more engaging than when your your kids have the chance to be creative. So that's another good one. And as you were talking, uh, the cool part about being more creative and building that into your lessons is it ties them with anything. Like if I'm going to, you know, if I'm doing some kind of gamification element for my chemistry students, I definitely want creativity creativity to be a part of that. So I need to think of like, you know, creative ways for them to earn these points, different things. It's not just all answer number two correctly. You got to, you got to have fun with it. Yeah. And here's another thing I thought about, and I I find this hilarious. I don't know why it's so hilarious to me, but (laughs) have you ever tried to get your students to make their own game or make questions for a test? Yes. Do you realize that they are way harder than anything that you would ever make? Yeah, it's, well, I don't, I don't do it anymore because they're just, it's just way too challenging. <laughs> so, I don't know. Maybe make, in this improv learning situation, maybe they make the graph and they exchange it with somebody else. And what they have to do is one day they both tell the other person's graph. And then the next day they have to tell their own graph story. And then they compare it. And see uh, which one you know works better, or 
what they've left out or maybe they misunderstood or something like that. Yeah, or that's, that's a great idea. I was thinking too, you know, when you said Survivor, I know this is not a, a game that was played in, in Survivor, at least when I was still watching the show. But, um, you know, as I have the, the chemistry lab, right, that is part of my room, I could I could make little tokens or little tags or something and hide these things around the room, like in different pieces of equipment and glassware so that just over the course of like being in the science lab, in the chemistry lab, randomly students could find these things. And when they find it, there might be like a simple little quick challenge written on there for them to complete and then show me that. And that would be, um, you know, a fun way to tie it in. That would be low stress, low pressure, literally just for the, the joy of it and to add that extra element to the class. Yeah. So Those were our professional goals. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about our personal that sometimes overlap. I know for me, mine is to simplify life. I I feel like I need to do some reflection over this holiday season and really figure out what's important to me and eliminate some of the distractions. So I think for me, I need to go through my cell phone and I need to get rid of the stuff that I don't use anymore anymore. Uh, my cell phone, I download everything. I want to try it out and then I leave it on there. I need to find a, a system that makes me more organized there. I already showed you my inbox. Yeah. I mean, that was pretty good. I have seven emails in my inbox. They were all from today. And uh, yeah, so yesterday, if you looked, my unread emails was uh, over 4,000. Wow. And uh, in my inbox was over 10,000. So I went through and I I organized labels and stuff like that. I put it in. So I feel like I'm setting myself up for a better 2023, which is pretty amazing there. But I don't want to stop there. I want to really think about some of the hobbies, hobbies I have and some of the other things that might be clouding my life a little bit that I can simplify. So I have I have time for first and foremost my family, second my professional life, and third some of the hobbies that you know maybe that I want to focus on. That's great. I gotta I gotta jump back real quick because I'm a little curious how you pared down four thousand emails. Was it uh, more snooze where you just snooze at everything for a later date? So you're gonna get like bombarded in a couple of weeks or? Were you just like labeling things or did you just mass delete like 3,000 of these things? Well, the first thing I did is I set up a filter and anything that said it was a newsletter I got rid of because if I didn't read it, it was probably not important. Right. And I'm subscribed to a lot of newsletters. Uh, I, I like to give them all a shot. I like to read them and if they have value, I typically keep them. But I will tell you, I haven't done a real good job lately to <laughs> unsubscribe from the ones that I do not find value in. Uh, maybe they it was a niche topic that they got me hooked on, and then I signed up for it, but they never stayed in that, at, that lane or avenue since then. Uh, so I got rid of all the newsletters. I, I used Unroll Me um, for those that that would unsubscribe me from all those uh, newsletters that you know, like I said, wasn't providing me value. It doesn't mean that they're not valuable, but they're just not valuable to me. They're not fitting my needs. Uh, and I did the label thing, you know. So. Now, every time you send me an email, it goes into a folder and it will sit there instead of in my main box, <laughs> which is fine. Yeah, that's the that's the key with labels. Sorry. Good for you, man. That's great. Um, I, You know, the only other one I was going to bring up, this is kind of a professional goal. And the, the more I'm thinking about it, it's, it's weirdly specific. So, I'll, I don't know. I need some help. Maybe if there's any other teachers out there who have been in this boat, you could just reach out to me on Twitter at NickGotTech and let me know how you've dealt with this, but I gotta, I gotta figure out a better workflow because I have two offices, which seems, I mean, at first I was pretty excited about it when I'm doing my tech coaching job, I'm in one spot. And then at lunchtime I switch over and teach chemistry again. So I literally move to my other desk in another office and I've tried to keep those two spaces separate, but I gotta tell you, it's a giant pain because if I, here's the example that hit me yesterday. If I have a stack of graded tests that are in my chemistry teaching office, um, 
the students know where to find me at all times. So they know that in the mornings I'm doing tech coaching stuff in the media center of the high school and they're coming to get chemistry help over here where I don't have any of my chemistry stuff and I'm just constantly running back and forth between these two places like a crazy person. I'm just walking constantly all day, which, you know, has some... <laughs> guys is laughing right now. I just need to say that, obviously, because it's a podcast, so you can't see it. But, like, I don't know what to do, man. And I can't... I've tried saying, well, I'll just carry everything around all the time. And I, I can't do that. I just can't live like that. So I, I'm going nuts. I need help, people. Oh, my goodness. There are people <laughs> that don't have a office in the hotel. Yeah, I know. That's And that's the other element I, is I feel To be bad honest with you, you don't need two offices. You need a work spot. Right. And you need an office. I would, I would yes. almost suggest that you pare down and you decide which office you want to keep. Yeah. And that's it. And if you want a work spot, I mean, it's not like the two offices are – you go outside, you walk 25 steps, you go inside, you walk 20 steps, and you're there. They're pretty close. You're right. It's not and like your classroom is in between the two. Yeah. I mean, you ever see uh, Robin Hood Men in Tights yeah. when the, the guy goes into the little creek <laughs> mm-hmm. and he flips out because he can't swim? Yeah. Even though the, the creek is like three inches deep? Yeah. I feel like that's this type of situation. I'm the guy going, I'm hopping on the east bank. I'm hopping on the west bank. <laughs> It's not that critical. Right. And you're the guy, you're little John in the water, little Johnson in the water, uh, <laughs> flipping around like a flailing duck. That's good. I don't know. That's my two cents. I think you just need to uh, maybe wear a book bag. Yeah, you're totally right. It's just not even a big deal. It's just in particular, maybe because it's like 10 degrees outside too. I uh, think it's that you're afraid that once one goes away, then you're stuck. I'm a f- very afraid of that. I don't want to give up either one because I like having a spot over there with the science people. So maybe what you do is you take the little desk in there yeah. and it's just your work spot. Yeah, maybe. And you give up the big one. I don't know. Okay. Anyway. All, all good ideas. Thank anyway, you, Nick's uh, you know, first world problems continue <laughs> and uh, reach out if you want to chime in on his situation. So should should we explain this uh, this new game we're going to try playing here, the Wheel of Ed Tech? You came up with it. Maybe you should intro this to everybody. All right. So basically, we never uh, typically we 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 have an outline to our show notes. We kind of know what we're going to discuss, but then we always stray away from it. Like I get a wacko idea, and he just sees the look in my face, and he's like, "Go ahead." You know, it's kind of like that. So I wanted to play a game where we don't have anything scripted, nothing. We have this wheel that has four categories on it, and we're using Flippity.net, and everyone knows how how we love Flippity.net. They have this uh, wheel randomizer, so there's four different categories, type of learning, and we put things on there like personalized learning, blended learning, flip classroom, gamification, those types of things. And then we have the type of project, whether it's summative assessment, formative assessment, homework, do now, uh, exit slip, something like that. And then we have the topic or subject because we're tech coaches, so we work with everyone and not all our listeners are science teachers. So we want to try to challenge ourselves in the subject. Now, if we do this, which we are going to do it, have a little grace for us because we are not experts in anything but science. All right. But we know enough and we've worked enough with people and other topics that we can get some general topics down, but if you're looking at the minutia, if we talk anything minute about a subject such as history and someone's out there fact checking us on World War II and our knowledge of World War II and uh, you know, the battle, if we get into that far, you might have to show some grace and just be like, yeah, nice try. <laughs> and then finally, we made a we made it even more challenging because we have a category where it says ed tech tool allowance and we have one two three four and four plus now that just means you can't go over that number unless you get four plus you have infinite amount it means you can't go over that number if it says one you have to stick to one tool 
And that's going to be difficult because we like the app smash a lot. So, and you can't cheat either. You can't say G Suite and use all the G Suite apps. Okay. You can't do it. Fair enough. All right. I'm just throwing out the rules. And here's the other rule. Uh, I'm going to spin for Nick. Nick's going to spin for me. And then what they're going to do is they're going to explain their activity. We're not pausing the recording. We're just going to keep going. So he has to work on this as we go. I mean, he can do some stalling tactics, which he probably will, knowing Nick. <laughs> oh, yeah. Expert staller. Uh, but for the most part, we're going to be off the cuff, and then we will type it into the show notes after the fact. Uh, once Nick goes, I will be able to, if I have any ideas to improve it or something I would change, I have the opportunity to say that. But we'll go through this uh, two each, I think, is is good for the show. And uh, everyone out there can reach out to We Got Tech, Guys Got Tech, Nick Got Tech, and you can let us know how we did and if we should do this ever again. It could be a solid no here. I'm not sure, but does that sound about right? Yeah, that was expertly explained. The only thing I'm wondering is who, who spins first. And who goes first as far as uh, designing their lesson? You want to do paper, rock, scissors? Um, yeah, let's do it. All right. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot, right? No, it's paper, rock, scissors. We got into this oh, in boy. episode Here three. Here we go already. All right. Wait, I, we got to restart. He, he like, I, <laughs> I showed him mine, no, no, no. and then he actually had the one that would win. It's been like... And then he changed it to a tie. It was weird. Here we go. All right. Uh, he still beat me. Okay. Rock, right. beats, rock beats scissors. So that means I'm going to spin first and you're going to go first. So here we go. I'll, I'll spin. I'm going to describe everything, describe everything that has come up on the uh, on the, the wheels, essentially, to the listeners so they know what to expect. And um, after I do that description, I'll kick it over to you to sort of take this away. So here we go. Spin at number one. And the spinning has concluded. So for type of learning, we have blended. So you're coming up with a blended learning lesson uh, with a uh, summative assessment in the history subject with three ed tech tools. So I'm gonna repeat all that. Blended learning, summative assessment in the history field with three different ed tech tools. Boy, that's that sounds like a tough one. History is what I was afraid of. So good luck, buddy. Oh, thank you. So. Now, blended learning is such a vague, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those hot topics out there, but it has unlimited use, I feel, to it. So I got, I got lucky with that. Summative assessment, a lot of people think of standardized tests, those types of tests. I'm not going to go that way. I'm going to go e-portfolio. Right, I'm just going to throw that out right now. In history, I think in history, we have an awesome opportunity uh, with portfolios to incorporate really personalized projects where they can go do research and they can take what they know in two different areas. And then for the ed tech tools, I mean, for an e-portfolio, you need some type of a website, whether it's, uh, I don't know, Google Sites. You can use Canva now. They have single web page things. You could use whatever website maker you want. I'm going to go with Google Sites, because I feel like a lot of people are familiar with that, all right? And in order to collect our research, um, I'm going to go with Google Forms and Slides. Okay. All right, those are the three things that I'm going to do. So Google Forms is going to allow me to throw out surveys uh, just to collect data, and I'll bring all this full circle and tell you what the actual project is in all a right. second. Um, Google Slides, I chose that because uh, I can bring in video very easily there. I can bring in pictures very easy. Otherwise, I would go with Google Docs where I can organize everything. But I feel like Google Slides can do that and has more opportunity. So my blended learning activity is going to be a summative assessment in history with those three. So it's forms, it's slides, and it is um, Google Sites. I'm going to just stay in the Google Sites range. All right, so my history project. Around Memorial Day is a great time for this. Veterans Day is a great time for this. Uh, if you're in Canada, Remembrance Day is a great time for this. Uh, 
I, I feel like sometimes we do not celebrate the people that have served our country uh, in the schools. And one of the things that breaks my heart every morning is the, you know, the pledge happens. And I remember when I was in school, if I didn't stand for the pledge, I mean, that was just unacceptable. But if I didn't say the pledge, I even got in trouble. Now I feel like, um, I don't know. I, I feel like it's a, it's, it's not a uniform effort. So it, it makes me, I don't know, feel a certain way about that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in, and it doesn't matter when you do it in the air, just stay at some times. We're going to have, my students are going to go out and they're going to find someone that served in our military or maybe someone's family member that served in the military and they're going to celebrate them. The first thing that they're going to do is either interview them or they're going to interview a family member or maybe both. And uh, they don't even, if, if they can't work face to face, that's fine. They could send them out a Google form and be like, Hey, can you uh, help me out? Give me some background on this. And then, you know, We'll set up an interview later and I'll fill in the gaps, but this is a good starting point. On a particular individual, you can find out what branch they served. You can find out uh, how many years they were in, what war they were in, were they active duty, were they, you know, whatever the case might be. They can get a picture of them and all this stuff can be collected and put into their web page, which is going to be their summative assessment. But whatever topic, whatever um, battle they were in or whatever war they were a part of or wherever they were stationed, they can do some background history on those places, those wars, those battles, that branch of the army, that branch of the Navy or whatever their platoon was, things like that. They can compile all that research and they can make a Google, pay, uh, Google site that has, you know, a little bit about them, their upbringing, their background stuff, the war that they fought in with some, you know, background stuff there and so forth and so forth. You know, so that's my that's my project right there. It's going to be something that celebrates our veterans. Yeah, that's pretty Im impressive. Um, I know you were limited by the number of tools there, which was three and, and you hit that three. The only thing I was thinking would be cool, and this, this would require a fourth. So this is not a knock on you. This is just a, an addition for anybody out there who's maybe thinking of doing something like this would be um, to throw in another Google tool, uh, Google Maps to this. One of my favorite things to do with Google Maps is use, use it to get that aerial view of a particular location. And if you're interviewing a veteran that is then connecting to a, a certain conflict or war, um, even if you know this could just be used separate from the interview project too, but pull up Google Maps and get that you know that current overview of an area, and then have the students sort of screen snip that and overlay on top of it, say like in maybe part of their slides presentation or Google Drawings, overlay on top of it where things happened for you know, for that particular military event, I think would be a really cool tie and in that there's the connection to modern day and what things look like. This is especially cool if you live in a historic area where things happen, because then students are seeing places that they know now and understanding exactly where uh, historical events took place. Uh, that, yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, Google Slides didn't serve much of a purpose in mine, and that would be your your suggestion would make that project uh, enhanced with uh, technology. So I'm all for that. Cool. All right, we're gonna go with you now. I'm gonna flip or flip the switch here. Get these wheels going. All right, for your type of learning, this is right up your alley. He's wondering if I'm saying that facetiously or not. And I'm not flip classroom. Oh boy. Right up his alley. It's a formative assessment. And in art, that might throw you a little bit. Right. And you can use two ed tech tools. So flip classroom, formative assessment, art, and two ed tech tools. Okay. So I'm gonna start off with the with the two ed tech tools uh, that I'm gonna be using here. Um, the first one, if we're doing a flipped classroom. That means the students are going to have to be viewing some content 
uh, prior to the lesson. And my favorite way to do that is video. I know it doesn't have to be video, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go with that. Um, so my video recording tool here is uh, strangely enough going to be PowerPoint. And I'll circle back to that um, if anybody's scratching their heads there, but PowerPoint to create the video. And the second tool is a weirdly enough new, uh, at least the extension part of it, new to us. Um, and what I'm talking about is something known as Poll Everywhere with Google Slides. That's the full name, Poll Everywhere with Google Slides. If you know Poll Everywhere, which you probably do, it's uh, you know one of the probably top five-ish formative assessment tools where kids uh, use their cell phones or their Chromebooks to answer poll questions and you see their responses aggregated in real time in like a bar graph. Uh, poll Everywhere is great, but they have an extension that automatically embeds into Google Slides. So you can just be presenting that slide deck and you know as you're presenting that slide deck, uh, the student results are coming in and you are seeing it in the slide. So you don't have to like click anywhere else. You can even control the poll from the slide. So like if you want to close a particular poll, you can do that right just by clicking within the frame of the slide itself. It's really neat. We we uncovered this actually, you know, credit where credit is due. You uncovered this uh, last week when a teacher was asking about how to collect student polling and we just kind of stumbled on it. Works really, really well. Uh, so my my project idea is this. I'm gonna it's you know art was the topic here. I'm gonna say it's art history. Um, I'm going to use this uh, new feature of PowerPoint called Cameo, which if you've been following our 12 days of EdTech, I talked about. I think I, I even mentioned it in episode 127. Uh, Cameo lets you make these really cool uh, screencast recordings of your PowerPoint slides where your webcam feed is kind of embedded in the slide itself and it just looks super professional. Uh, the background of each slide will be a different work of art uh, from a different, you know, famous classic artist or even a modern artist, doesn't matter, whatever you're doing, and just kind of describing the, the features of those different works of art to the students. We're talking really quick, like maybe a minute per uh, piece of, you know, piece of artwork for a total of like a five minute video. The students watch that before they come to class. When they get to class, there's some type of a grouping activity, no technology involved. They just sort of sit um, maybe with access to these artworks printed out on paper so they can look at them, jot down their ideas, discuss what they think about them. You know, as far as content delivery goes, you can tie in whatever you want here, whatever the focus is, whether it's the the lives of these artists or the style of the painting or the historical connections, that's up to you. And then for the formative assessment piece, you come back together and use Poll Everywhere with Google Slides to sort of gauge what everybody thinks about these different pieces. So each of the five um, works of art that was in the video will you know, be shown in the Google Slides presentation, followed by a poll question using this extension. Uh, to sort of bring the whole class together. And that would be the formative assessment piece. Um, of course, depending on those responses, that's gonna guide what you do as a teacher as you sort of facilitate that whole class discussion. But that's what I'm thinking in the art world, man. What do you what do you say to that one? I, I think you did a nice job. Uh, I, I like the idea of, of watching a video and for your flipped classroom, I think that's a great way of doing it. And that's how you yourself have really taken AP chemistry to the next level is by doing that. And I really like how you brought out the group effort at the very beginning of the next class where they discuss things. Um, one thing I would like to throw out there is uh, when they're working in their groups, I would like them to do something. And it doesn't need to be an ed tech tool, but somehow manipulate what they just learned. And in art, a lot of it is by showing your understanding of techniques and things like that. So if you looked at Van Gogh's work, well, what makes Van Gogh's work Van Gogh's work? You know, is it a brush stroke? Is it a certain type of, of paint? Is it certain types of colors? What is that? Uh, bring that out a little bit and have the group all work on one small canvas where they have to make something. And I think by making it, it really ingrains those types of skills or whatever the the lesson wants to emphasize. Uh, I think that 
that's what happens. I think it just gets ingrained into the brain. But uh, I think he did an amazing job. I was I was taking a couple notes in the show notes uh, with it, and uh, you mentioned cameo and PowerPoint. You did make a uh, video on YouTube going over how to use that and what it looks like. It's a really phenomenal tool. So we will make sure that we uh, attach the video in the show notes to that so you could take a look at that. And then, uh, yeah, nice job. All right. Thanks, man. I, I love your idea of having the groups try to recreate a work uh, collectively. That's a, a very interesting add-on to this. Let's... Uh, so I guess that concludes round one. Let's go into round two where we just repeat that. So I'm going to spin the wheel again for Geis, and he'll do his again, and I'll do one more before we wrap it up. Here we go. Uh, spinning the wheel of EdTech. <clears throat> All right. This, this is, works out good for you because this is also right up your alley. Uh, we've got creativity-based learning, a uh, learning style pretty much invented by you. Uh, so that's, that's great for this. Creativity-based learning. The type of lesson or activity is an introduction, so something to start off a lesson. This is the worst one, for us at least, not the worst subject, of course, world language. So you got world language introduction using creativity-based learning in two ed tech tools. This is would be my worst nightmare, so I'm glad, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that this set came up for you. One more time for everybody, creativity-based learning, introduction, in the world languages with two ed tech tools. Actually, the two ed tech tools is what's making it hard. Yeah. I, I feel like I could do this with zero. Right. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Easier. Um, all right. Creativity-based learning. Uh, underneath that, I love to use a narrative to drive creativity-based learning. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use... Oh, my goodness. ThingLink, I think, because they have a collection of 360 images nice. where it allows you to look around. You could easily use like uh, one of the Google Maps or Google Street View or whatever it is right. to get a 360 uh, image. So one of those two, whichever one that you want, uh, that has a 360 picture that allows you to kind of look and observe at things. I'm going to use uh, ThingLink because it allows you to look in a 360 view but it also allows you to attach different things in there. So you can attach text, you can attach a YouTube video, uh, you can attach uh, pictures, whatever you, you might want. So I'm gonna use, for mine, I'm gonna use ThingLink with a 360 video. Uh, I'm just gonna use the running of the bulls as the, uh, you know, the topic for this in, in Spanish class. Uh, and what I'll do is give them a 360 picture that I find somewhere, whether it's on their site or somewhere else. And in there, I'll give them five little icons that they could click on, which is going to introduce them to uh, the town um, that it's ran in. Uh, it's going to introduce them to the people that participate, what they're called, it's going to introduce them to the bulls. It's going to introduce them to the purpose of the run, like the cultural linkage there. And I'll pick something else. And then what they're going to have to do is they're going, this will all be in English, uh, will be most of it, because I'm going to say that this is going to be for Spanish 2, maybe. Wow. Okay. Spanish 2. <laughs> but you could, you could vary. You can make variations depending on the level. Sure. But out of those five words, which I give them a little bit of background to, they're going to come up with a story. They're going to come up with a narrative uh, that's going to help teach other people that are not in custom with uh, the culture. And they're going to come up with a story that's going to introduce them to a little bit about the cultural uh, relevance behind the running of the bulls. Like, why would anyone want to do that? Okay, I know it happens, but what is the cultural relevance behind it? So they're going to use ThingLink. They'll be able to see maybe a street where this is happening or something like that. They'll be able to click on five different words that has a little bit of what, what it's about underneath it. And that's all on ThingLink. And then what they're going to do is uh, they're going to tell a story. Uh, why don't we throw out Book Creator for this one? All right. So in Book Creator, you can 
drag in videos and pictures and stuff like that. And maybe they have to make a little kid's book out of it using Spanish. So they're, they're going to write in Spanish and, uh, yeah, they'll have videos, pictures, all that stuff. So that's, that's my, uh, my activity. Yeah. And then they, uh, you know, if you're going to do that, you might as well throw our, our favorite tool right now, Canva for education in there where they can design some cool stuff, uh, in Canva and make that part of the book that they design. Yeah, that's a great way to add a break the rules and add another tool. That's <laughs> uh, but you know, in the real game of life, we we get to add whatever we want. So I'm gonna I'm gonna accept that change of Canva, uh, and we'll go with that. And like I said, uh, we haven't mentioned ThingLink in a while, but it is a pretty powerful uh, picture annotation tool that really allows you to bring things to life. So we'll go with that. And uh, I think I need to give you your last one. I hope it's very challenging. Yeah, I'm nervous. I, I don't know, especially if the number of tools is four or more, just because that's a lot of things to come up with. But we'll, we'll see how it goes. All right. Do we want to do duplicates? Um, that's up to you. I don't. I'll do it. I don't care. As the the spinner for this final uh, round, you can decide that. Uh, well, luckily, I think I. Uh, was mine a conclusion or was it an introduction? Intro. You had an intro, so. All right. So I did the introduction. You're going to do the conclusion. All right, sweet. And this should help you prepare for your, uh, this is how we're going to come full circle, but this should help you prepare for your New Year's resolution because you got gamification. All right. Uh, for a conclusion of a activity or lesson in English language arts, but this one is the kicker. One ed tech tool. One ed tech tool for a conclusion in English language arts. Boy. So I was afraid of two things. I was afraid of one ed tech tool or four or more ed tech tools, and I landed on the one ed tech tool. So if I'm limited to one thing and I have to conclude the lesson with that one thing, um, I'm going to say that the, the lesson itself is a reading assignment. We'll keep it vague. So if your students are reading a novel, they can read the, uh, you know, they'll be reading that novel during the class period. If you're doing short stories, poems, whatever it is, and we'll totally leave EdTech out of it and just say that there's paper copies of this in the classroom. You know, the lesson itself can be conducted however you like as a, as a teacher there. Of course, whatever reading style you use, whatever grade level your kids are, um, are working in, that's fine. The conclusion and the one ed tech tool to make all of this happen uh, in the gamification realm is going to be a, something known as Bamboozle. Um, I'm a fan of this particular game platform. You've probably heard me mention it before, although it's been a while. Uh, the reason I like it is because it builds in the students speaking to each other in a way that you don't get with the other really great tools that are out there. Like I'd be tempted to throw out GimKit just because how fun it is, but I really want the kids talking to each other about these readings that they have just done. And that's what Bamboozle does so well. So based on what the readings are, I'm going to sort of pre-generate some questions in there that I want them to reflect on, this, sort of hitting on the, the key topics or the themes of that writing. Or, you know, if our focus is grammar and writing style, I'm going to ask them about those types of things as I build out the, this bamboozle, you know, set of questions. We're going to come back together with probably 20 minutes left. Um, and if you haven't used bamboozle before, it's kind of like, you know, back when I was in school, before they had all these fancy gaming platforms, where there, you, it could just be a, you know, a projection screen with like a Jeopardy board, right? And the question is read aloud. Uh, so the students will see like a checkerboard with numbers on each square. They can say, I want to answer question four. You click it, question four flips over. And they're in teams of however many students per team you choose. And as a team, they have to then sort of confer with one another and agree on and come up with one collective answer and they literally just share it out to the class. So there, there is no ed tech at all that the students are using. They're just talking in real life, which is what I like about it. They say it, then as the teacher, you are the one running this screen, so you click check answer, and it gives them some feedback on that. 
And, um, you know, depending on how you want to play it, you could just have that be the end of it and then jump over to the other team. Or you could, you know, let that kind of spark its own discussion and ask some follow up questions. But if I'm limited to one ed tech tool in ELA world, I'm going to make it uh, bamboozle to close out this uh, this particular lesson. I like the lesson. I do. But I was I was trying to think about how I would run the same exact lesson. And uh, I'm going to share it. I have nothing to add to yours because it's a solid one. But right. I'm going to share mine because I think it it's 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 different. So, and mostly because this past weekend my family played categories. Okay. But I'm thinking that if you take any article that you have, or if you're doing a story, it would be easier. And you pick a topic out of that, like uh, conflict, and students are in groups and they have two minutes to name as many conflicts that happen in that that book or whatever. You could pick whatever topic. You yeah, want. sure. I'm sure. I'm choosing conflict. They have many as much. Uh, as they could write down and then you place categories with that. I did this in my science classes. I would do that. I would ask them a question. They would have two minutes, write everything down. And then what we would do is we would count how many, uh, groups answered the same thing. We would write it up on the board. They would keep track of their points where, you know, if they had something unique, we'd write it up on the board and then we would collect data that way. And then I would, that would be my intro to graphing lesson. So based on our answers, they had to graph it. But I don't know why I thought of it, but I did. And, uh, you know, that's just what happens during these episodes. Well, that, you know, that's an important reminder, too. And, and I fell into the trap. We always, you know, especially as ed tech people, you kind of get pulled into constantly feeling like you've got to use one of the, you know, I, I got to use GimKit or I need to use Kahoot because that's the ed tech tool for gamification. But, like, you can just play a game and then build in the ed tech around that, like, even if it's just recording answers in, in like, a shared Google Doc or something. So that, I'm glad you had a, a different spin on it there because you don't want to always feel like you, you need to use one of these services to play a game. So excellent addition and uh, excellent job all around. I think that was cool. We got we – got, we hit history, art – world language and ELA and you know I think some pretty creative ideas across the board so I'm gonna say we are both winners in this game what do you think yeah I think we did a great job uh, especially for not having any of this stuff pre-planned uh, and just going straight through and recording good for us there you go uh, I will say this uh, a lot of times with the new year everyone has one word do you have a one word what do you mean like your one word for your one the new year Usually it's a word that represents something that you're going to focus on. Two words. Okay. New desk. All right. And <laughs> I'm just going to go with why. Why? And I'm not going to explain why. All right. Maybe in a different episode, but I guess this is a good time to wrap it up. Uh, we're Got Tech, the podcast. We love that you, if you're listening to this point, we love the fact that you decided to join us for the full episode. Uh if you find value in what we're doing, please make sure that you follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, our YouTube channel, Twitter at We Got Teched, at Guys Got Teched, at Nick Got Teched, and we do have a Facebook page as well. Uh, lately, we've been getting a uptick on Apple Podcasts ratings. Uh, not many reviews, but we got a lot of ratings. I think we're up to 40. We're holding a 4.9 out of 5 stars and... and uh, the one piece of constructive criticism that we got was pretty awesome, and we made changes. So thank you if you're that listener. Uh, we do appreciate any type of feedback. Uh, so if you could, if you have time, go over there. Also go to our webpage, gottech.com. You'll be able to find all our recent blog posts and videos, such as the 12 Days of EdTech. Uh, I encourage you to check that out. And until next time... Goodbye, 2022. Welcome, 2023. Happy New Year's. Everybody stay healthy and live on. 
Thanks for listening to Got Tech, the podcast. Remember to subscribe to our show and follow us at We Got Tech on Twitter so you can stay up to date with the latest episode releases, blog posts, product reviews, and PD announcements. You can also follow Geist and I individually at Geist Got Tech and at Nick Got Tech on Twitter or on Instagram at Nick Got Tech. Finally, remember to check out our website, gottech.com, where we post all our episodes, articles, and resources available to you for free. Until next time.